Hi. Well, first of all, I'm sorry because I was planning to put a lot more shirts here, but it looks like I overestimated the, the string and it was too heavy. So I cannot show all my shirts. Um, because this is an event about showing shirts, you know, this is all an excuse to show all the phosphorus shirts we have. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about here, so this is, um, this is a, a topic I have been uh, working on for the last uh, year. For those of you who don't know, I started working for Red Hat a year ago. And um, I changed a bit the, the subject of the things I was um, working on from pure geospatial metadata stuff to uh, how to integrate processes and handle data workflows. And I have to say I was a bit surprised to discover all the tools I'm working right now with because I'm surprised I haven't seen them on Phosphorgis before. I think we are seriously lacking this kind of tools or specifically these tools because they are uh, open source also. And well, I think it's interesting to show them to you. Um, the idea of this talk and why I talk about Jon Snow here a bit is because, well, um, in the last month you have seen how people uh, have been um, publishing data, have been uh, using that data to do run analysis, uh, to do some kind of um, data collection, conflation, um, integrate some data with some other data to generate some, um, feed some neural networks. And we have seen uh, real time science and it has been really cool because what well, we have seen real time science, people collecting data, um, analyzing that data, arriving to conclusions, experimenting, seeing if those conclusions were right or not, correcting in real time. And this is something that um, has happened since science started um, for centuries already, uh, millennia even. But we haven't seen that happening in real time. Uh, John Snow, the John Snow I'm going to talk about a bit, is uh, the, the this doctor that studied uh, a cholera outbreak in in London in nineteenth uh, century. And uh, what he did at that time, uh, doctors thought that cholera was something that, or illnesses in general, was something that come from evil spirits that were around us. So if you uh, just happen to touch or get invaded by that evil spirit, you get sick. And then uh, the, the way of um, um, of passing that illness to other people was with this evil spirit that were passing from a patient to a person that uh, then become the patient. And uh, John Snow was a doctor that was, was not very, um, he didn't think it was how this happened really. So he started collecting data, he started gathering data on, he, he thought that it may be related to something geospatial related, maybe the water people were drinking. So he started collecting data on uh, people that get cholera, what kind of uh, water they were drinking. And he even uh, discarded some of layers because there were people that maybe didn't drink from the water pump that was closer to their house, but maybe they were drinking from the water hose that was closer to their work uh, place. So finally, he drew these maps and he drew these, um, he, he did a lot of analysis with the data he collected and he realized that, yes, Cholera is caused by, uh, was caused at that moment by a water pump that was dirty, so it has the bacteria that um, made cholera happen. So this is the kind of thing that we have seen kind of happening here with COVID-19 because we have seen a lot of institutions publishing data about number of cases, when uh, number of, well, rate of death, rate of uh, um, infection, uh, cities where or countries that had more or less uh, infected people, the kind of laws and rules, they, 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 the kind of shutdown or lockdown they were imposing on the citizens, if it was something voluntarily, if it was something more militarily imposed. So 
people start working with this data and we start seeing a lot of cool maps. Uh, I think you may have seen some people complaining on Twitter because those maps were not very well drawn because it was not made by just special people. And the thing is that, uh, yeah, also because of lockdown, people had a lot of free time and we have a lot of tools to analyze data. So people just start arriving to conclusions because they didn't really understand the data they were working on and they were starting to make correlations um, like they really cause things, not really understanding the, the importance of things like the density of populations or things like um, demographics, the importance of having a big international airport nearby. These kind of things affected the data and they didn't realize that. So they just pump, uh, feed their algorithms, their neural networks with data and things happened and they published that and it was a bit of chaos. So some of us were a bit angry. <laughs> I was a bit angry on Twitter because, uh, I mean, seriously, if you don't understand what you're doing, you, you may remember Victor Olaja last year, um, a couple of talks he gave saying, we shouldn't make QGs even more user friendly because what happens is people who don't understand what they're doing, they just keep pushing buttons and releasing data that is not accurate or is not what it should be because they don't really understand what they're doing. But yeah, nobody cared. These uh, people keep publishing things that didn't make sense. They keep uh, publishing conclusions that didn't make sense either. And yeah, and, uh, please, I mean, um, huh. This is not showing the Twitter I wanted to show. So wait. Ah, the bar from here. No. Okay, this is a tweet. I can show you like this. Oh, it's. So this was a tweet that um, some neural networks were feed to. Um, distinguish um, some x-ray things to determine if it was COVID or not and they pass some cat photos to it and the algorithm said this is COVID in half the cats. So seriously if you don't know what you're doing be careful. Uh, but at some point I start reading some complaints that were not that um, bad because they were complaining that um, the institutions that were publishing data, they changed the data, they changed the variables because they realized that it made more sense to um, measure on a different way or measure different things. And people start getting angry because they say, okay, you just ruined my whole algorithm, you just ruined my whole uh, neural network or my in artificial intelligence because I have to redo this from scratch. And I was surprised, why don't you have to redo this from scratch? Don't you have the algorithm already? Can you just modify a bit, small stuff, so it just work? And the thing is, no, because they haven't automatized their workflows. They did all this manually, so that's why changing something in the source or changing something or adding different data or having to change things in their workflow was so annoying because they had to do manually everything all over again. And I realized, okay, maybe I can help here because this is the kind of things I'm working for, uh, working on, integrating processes, um, doing data workflows, moving data from one place to another, transforming it, conflating. So in the end, when you are working with data and you're analyzing data, you can more or less summarize um, the things you're doing like this. So you collect the data or update uh, your data sets then you homogenize it because, well, if you are, for example, comparing from um, data from different countries, maybe they are using different units of measure or they are using different small tweaks you have to do to homogenize the data. Then you conflate it, you mix it, you process it with other data coming from other data sources. And in the end, you have your data ready to 
pump it to the analyze algorithm and then you get the output and then you can publish whatever you are doing, a graph, a map, or maybe you are just checking the data to see what's happening. So this is the kind of things that mostly in the geospatial world, we don't really have a good tool to automatize, right? We, we end up scripting things. And you know, when you script things, what happens in the end is that you have to maintain that script, you, you reinvent the wheel, you redo a lot of errors that other people have already solved. So having a good tool for this is good. Um, so that's why I wrote my first uh, post about what would Jon Snow do in this case, because he did everything by hand, but we are dealing here with big spatial data, big data. We are dealing here with data that if you really take all the variables into account, it's more than just um, a couple of megas or gigas of data. It's something that doesn't even fit on a hard disk. It's something that you really need to collect uh, from external sources, have um, maybe some storage in the cloud to have all this data. And you cannot handle this manually, especially if you have to change something, redo everything again, and you don't have this automation. So I'm going to, um, for example, this is the kind of things we do with uh, the tools I'm going to describe. We have some CSV data you split by row, so you want to process each row independently, and then you get some data from an XML API, you get some data from a database, you conflate that data, you process that data, you take the attributes you want, then maybe you aggregate all the rows again into one single thing, and then you store the thing, to the data you have uh, processed it into some database. And this is the kind of thing that the first approach would be to script this, and please don't script this. We have tools to do this. What tools? Well, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Apache Camel, which is uh, like the nerdy integration framework. You uh, can uh, just write like a line or maybe two or three lines per step, and that's it, because maybe you have to configure something. And then I'm also going to talk to you about uh, synthesis, which is uh, a, uh, it, which has a user interface that allows you to do the same things you would do with Camel, but just with drag and drop and click and fill some text field. So it's more uh, oriented to people that are not developers or are not used to develop. And um, well, they both integrate very well uh, with each other and both integrate very well with other tools like Kafka or like databases or like um, REST API. So the idea here is to um, see how we could do a very simple workflow that can be extended to complex workflows. Um, the way we explain this usually, the way we explain how Camel works is with Legos. So you have like every step, uh, each step you define is like a different uh, piece of um, different piece of Lego. So you um, can connect each other on a um, standard way, and you can replace one piece and put another and all of them will fit perfectly. Maybe you need to do some mapping to, so the output of one piece of Lego and the input of the next piece of Lego connect properly because maybe in one uh, step you call an attribute ID and in the next you call it identifier. So you have to match that. But the idea is that really each step is independent and can be connected to any other step. So you can easily add more pieces, you can remove pieces, you can also have um, uh, loops over pieces, like loop over rows in a CSV, or you can have conditional. So you decide if this piece of data has this uh, attribute, I do something. If it has some other attribute, I do some other thing. Um, And it's demo time. 
So, um, Kamen uh, has uh, is um, well, is Java based, but it can uh, you can feed Camel with uh, uh, source files that are from different. Uh, it can be an XML, uh, JavaScript file, a Java file, uh, Ruby. It has a lot of uh, different languages it understands. And Camel K is Camel, but working on Kubernetes. It's Kubernetes native, which means you can easily run it on a container. So if you have, for example, a Kubernetes and OpenShift or any similar um, Kubernetes uh, compatible service, you can say, okay, uh, I'm going to define this workflow in this file and I'm going to tell Campbell to run it on this, um, on this serverless service. And with Camel, I control if it's running, I see the logs, I can remove it, I can update it. So, the first, uh, this is an example of a Hello World workflow. So, uh, I say um, each second, these are many seconds, I'm going to send a message to this log that is going to be Camel or Yammer. And I can run it, I can see the log, and I can delete, delete it. So now I change the, because I need a console for this, and I just lost where the zoom is here. Um, I don't know if you know, this is Visual Studio Code, and I have here a console. So I can edit a file, a JavaScript file, and I'm just going to copy and paste. And I say uh, I'm logged in in uh, OpenShift, which I have somewhere. So let's cross fingers and say, I'm going to run this. Okay. Sorry. I can check that this is building. This means that this is processing the file I just uh, created with the, work, uh, with the workflow. It's reading it, checking what dependencies it needs and downloading if needed any dependency. In this case, I guess the dependencies are very simple because it's just a timer and a log. And still building. Building. Usually it is faster, but I completely cleaned up everything, so it has to download everything from scratch. Please don't take so long. Building it. Hi. Running. Okay, now the log should show starting, and now every second it throws the log. So I delete this. And now I can do the other workflow, which is the one we described here, which is more complex. Um, so this XML API is going to be nominating. So you see we can um, query any XML API. This database is a Postgres, this database is a Mongo, and this data CSV is going to be this one, which is all, it only has uh, five records because it's, um, I don't want to put nominating under too much, too much stress. So this is a didact tutorial, which allows me to just um, run things by clicking and 
I just created a new namespace to run this. I changed to that namespace. Uh, I check I have camel installed, which I have because I already use it. I'm going to deploy a MongoDB to, stop, to store the data. I'm going to deploy a Postgres to store the data. You can check this is uh, being deploying. The Postgres looks like it's already up. So I'm going to try to connect and create a table with some dummy data to just match it with the CSV data. And I run the integration. And I'm going to add uh, transfer is not, it's yeah, basic. Sorry, because I was changing the versions here and changing some file names but it should work. So the integration is created. I can check it's building. And this is going to run the, the workflow I described. Uh, while it uh, deploys, I'm going to show you how. I don't want the Java file. This is the source code, which is a bit long, 200 lines of code, but because I'm doing a lot of uh, stuff here. So, quickly, uh, review. I don't like the Visual Studio, but. So, I initialize a couple of things and the workflow. Every a lot of seconds, I query this EA uh, report, which I simplified on this because I didn't want to have hundreds of lines. And then I uh, read the CSV format, I split it in, uh, for each row, I process the CSV, which means uh, I get these values from the CSV, the lat, long, unit, uh, level of air pollution, and the pollutant. I'm going to, after processing the CSV, I'm going to query nominating with uh, lat long and getting the XML, which will give me all the uh, details of the address I'm querying. I process that XML from nominating, which is just extracting the address. As you can see, uh, Nomiatim uh, gives me an XML, but I convert it to map class. And then I um, uh, query the database uh, I populated before to extract some data, which I also added to the um, set of values I'm uh, storing. I aggregate it. I uh, build a GeoJSON, which is just type and features and all the attributes I have collected. And then I uh, uh, store the GeoJSON on a uh, Mongo database. If you want to see the, the GeoJSON, you can add some log here. And I can run it again, uh, which was here. It's been updated. So if I close this. Um, it's storing a document, which is a JSON. Da, 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 da. It's not showing the JSON, the GeoJSON, because it's um, storing it in a document type. Okay, 
running out of time, so I'm going to show you the other version, which is exactly the same thing as this, but uh, with drag and drop um, click. Where is the zoom? Here, share. So if you don't want to do code, even if it's as simple as it is, you have syntheses in which you can create integrations. Just click, click, click. And this is the same hello world um, we have run before. This is using camel on the backend. And running out of time, but it should show here things. So you also have, um, you can map easily stuff just by drag and drop here. I'm not going to show because I'm running out of time. Uh, this is just special ready. This is uh, automating workflows very easily. So if something changes, you can easily maintain, update, upgrade, change stuff. So I think this is something we have been lacking for a long time in the geospatial world. Uh, and going back to the original title, what would Jon Snow do? If it was, uh, if he was alive and doing COVID research or any other type of research, use the proper tools. Do not script uh, things. Um, use Phos4G. Don't reinvent the wheel. And please automatize stuff. If it's not with camel and synthesis, do it with something else. But please automatize it. Don't don't let uh, don't let that happen. That if they change your data sources, if they change something or you realize you have to modify something on your workflow that you have to redo everything from scratch and it's impossible. And it's, no, it's just changing one line of code on the workflow. And I don't know if you realize these um, numbers. This is the, I, I did a Twitter poll about animals. This is the number of cats, this is the number of camels, this is the number of humans, and this is none of the above, just for those who were curious. And if you have more uh, questions about this, I, I surely encourage you to search about camel and synthesis if you are doing data analysis or workflows of data, or you need to do anything that requires more than a couple of steps handling data. And um, this presentation is on slidesdevelopment.com in case you want to check because there are many um, URLs. Um, if you, uh, I, I read uh, in some other presentation that the problem with open source is that you don't have a support. If you need support because you think this is too big, you can get support not only in Red Hat, there are many other companies that offer support, but this was the first link I have in mind. Um, and uh, if you are interested in this, please, you can ask me later. You can uh, send me an email. You can send me Twitter. You can ask anywhere. And I think this is it. Just showing you that this is the Hello Phosphor G. And it's running every minute, so it will take some time. Um, I think I ran out of time, right? We're heading towards that. Um, we don't have any questions uh, in the in the chat uh, at present. Um, so last chance, anybody, if you want to ask Maria anything. Um, I know for one, there's a few things that I'll be looking up there. That was fabulously geeky and had great camels and kitties and everything which is just awesome so um brilliant thanks ever so much maria um 
just checking. Yeah, I, I try to I try to be not very very technical because as this is a keynote. I mean, I I try to be a bit fast on the technical side because the idea is this: you can have easily workflows with just small pieces of code or um, drag and drop, click 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 with synthesis. So the idea is, please don't write your own code for this. There are tools for this. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. 